Welcome to Mind Shift. We're going <laughs> to jump right into this. All right. This might be our UFC episode. We're in the cage. We might be going back to battle ready a little bit. <laughs> Am I what? John Jones? Is that his name? Joe Jones. John Jones? Joe Jones. I don't know UFC. Yeah. I'm just making the reference. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I'm Dana White. All right. <laughs> or, and you're Joe Rogan. <laughs> Two bald guys. Uh, okay, here's the deal. So you've been getting a few interesting DMs, and it is, it's not a new thing that we get hate. No. But you, you had an interesting message from a woman that you actually incorporated into your talk yesterday mm -hmm. in, in the yes. South Pass campus at Mosaic. So yeah. it will go online. But yeah. you used you, you referred to a moment in your DMs. And but I've had others since then. <laughs> you've had others since then. And one happened last night when we were celebrating yeah. your birthday because you had COVID on your mm -hmm. birthday. So we waited a few weeks when we were back in town and we celebrated it last right. night. And happy birthday. Happy, happy late birthday. Thank you so, so much. Yeah, I'm so grateful you were alive. But it was also so fun. I actually think, and I don't know how you feel, but I actually think it was more fun celebrating your birthday on not on your birthday because there was no pressure. It was like, I already gave you the gifts. <laughs> like I've already, I've already done my part. And it was just like fun having everybody over the house. I just loved having people over and seeing friends and introducing my friends to each other. And yeah, it was really, really special. Yeah, it was fun. What's funny is that the first person to show up showed up an hour early. Who? Lewis House. He showed up that early? He showed up an hour early. So he, uh, Kim came and got me in the back and she goes, Lewis is here. He's already here. <laughs> so I ran. Why did he show up so early? He said, hey, I just want to make sure I got here so we could hang before all the people. Oh, that's very kind. So we went to back, played foosball, and yeah. just for the record, I destroyed him. You played ping pong? No, no, first we played, oh, played foosball. Foos oh, so I came in and you already, you... No, we'd already had a half an hour. Oh, that's crazy, I got there 30 on minutes guard. I mean, just that's like, you wild. know. And so we played foosball, which I destroyed him. Then we went and played ping pong. Okay. And we had uh, two great matches. Okay. And uh, we split them, one and one. Oh, that's funny. And we were both dredged in sweat before everybody showed up. <laughs> He's really, really good. He's really good. And had, okay. had a great time with his friends. And That's awesome. What a great friend to want to show up before everyone else. Just to get alone time with Just you. Just to get, have some one-on-one -on -one time together. <laughs> That's so funny. Uh, okay, so you've been getting a few DMs and, and a few comments. And usually, I mean, I'm in your DMs and so is Austin and a few <laughs> other people. You have, you have the least privacy out of anyone I, in, I know. <laughs> and I, I have the security cameras of your house on my phone. Like yeah, you, you don't give me any space for a secret life. <laughs> no, I think I told somebody the other day, I was like, if I needed to, I could rob that man. And <laughs> <laughs> you have every password, every password, every code, every bank account. Um, no, no, but you, 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 an interesting thing happened and maybe you could set the story up. Yeah. I'm kind of going to, I'm going to get to the end, mm -hmm. but basically <laughs> a woman DM'd you and said, you need to make your life count what yeah. has happened to you. Yeah. And, and that was after, you know, critique. And, right. So can right. you break it? Break, uh, well, break I'll, it down I'll start with us. the end because after my wonderful birthday party, I sat down, I was by myself. I finally grabbed my phone and then I see a, a comment from someone uh, just coming at me really hard. You know, what the heck is going on? You used to be all about Jesus. Yeah. And then I look in my DMs and he sends me uh, an essay, absolutely just berating me and telling me how, you know, I hate that. Uh, my life has, you know, gone so off course. And he'd heard me speak 20 years ago. And yeah. you know, 20 years ago, I was, you know, um, what I guess what he needed me to be, but now I'm, you know, but way off course and I'm not. How dare you not be what he needs in this very yeah. moment for him. And, uh, and so I thought it's so ironic. What if he the, tells and, Jesus. End of my birthday day is kind of yeah. thing, you know, and, um, and then, it, and I've been getting, I, I get a lot of those and I understand why. Do you get a lot of them or do the ones that you get stand out? It absolutely affects me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So when I see them, it does hurt. It does make me feel sad. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I have to go through my internal process so I can extricate them from my soul. Yeah. And, but um, yeah, I talked about the, this woman, uh, Australian, and uh, from across the world, she felt it was really important to tell me that my life wasn't counting. Interesting. And that um, I didn't, I don't talk about Jesus on my Instagram, which is kind of odd because I think every week we release a talk I do from the Bible. Yes. And on the Mosaic or on your personal podcast yeah, and, and on, on every Apple week I'm inviting Spotify. people to enter into a relationship with Jesus. Yes. So somehow it's still not like enough or doesn't meet her standards. Yeah. And, and, and I know you're not supposed to respond. I know you're not. I know. It, it, but it was just one of those moments where I just thought, this is a good moment for me as a son to just, <laughs> you said something to me earlier. You said, Aaron, you're my son. You need to act different. 
Erwin. <laughs> Father, you're my son. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so I told myself, you shouldn't respond. But I started to respond. But I thought, well, before I respond, um, le let me click on her Instagram and just get a sense of who she is. When a person is private, I don't usually respond at all because they don't want anyone to know their life, but they want to have been put into my life. Right. So I, her Instagram was open. So I went to her Instagram and she was exactly what I didn't want her to be. She seemed like a wonderful person. She seemed very sweet. Yeah. Uh, she, mom, you know, wife, great, you know, looking family. And as I, and I scrolled her Instagram, I thought, oh, these are people I probably would really like. And yeah. I think they would like me if they yeah. knew me. And, and clearly I've become a huge disappointment to her. Yeah. And, and I'm not sure why I did this, but I thought, I wonder who she follows. And you can click who people follow. Right. And she follows, uh, she followed a few pastors that are really wonderful people and more traditional. Okay. In their way they communicate and express their faith and everything. And, okay. and so that made sense. And, and then she followed other people, like, I think like Mel Robbins and Tony Robbins and, okay. um, and different people who, um, are not people of faith, yeah. but they're in the personal development space or personal growth space. And, yeah. and so I thought that's odd. And so I, I responded to her and I said, um, I, I, it's hard for me to understand the emotional energy it takes for a person to tell another person yeah. that they don't know how to live their life. Yeah. yeah. And I said, but you seem like a really nice and really kind person. But I did make an observation in her entire Instagram. She never mentioned Jesus once. Hmm. And so I thought it was odd that she never mentions Jesus, but is upset with me because she doesn't feel like I mentioned Jesus enough. Mm. And then on top of that, I said, you seem to follow some pastors who are really good. And so it seems like you get a lot of spiritual input in your life, mm -hmm. but you're also following some of my friends mm -hmm. who don't believe in Jesus. Did you send them the same note mm. and of judgment on their lives, which I knew she didn't. Right. And she actually responded. And she said, uh, she never responded to the fact that she never mentioned Jesus, she ignored that. But she said, you're right, I, I do follow other pastors and that should be enough. And I do follow these other people who don't believe in God and for personal growth and development. Mm. And, and, you know, and then she, and she said, I regretted that I sent it the moment I said it, but I think you're actually able to- Unsent. Unsent. So yeah. she didn't regret it enough to unsent. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. <clears throat> and and what was really going through my mind is, first of all, I have never sent a negative DM or comment to another human being in my life. No, 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 no. And I don't have the emotional energy to try to control someone else's life. I don't have the interest. I love my life. And so I'm happy when other people are living the life they love. Right. I have so many friends who believe in God and so many friends who believe in Jesus and so many friends who don't believe in Jesus and don't believe in God. Okay. And I got them all. I got them all. Right. And I have never sent a comment to any of them trying to judge their life or tell them how to live. It's a very unique posture to take with someone, especially someone you don't know. And I've never had a negative comment okay. from a person who didn't believe in God or didn't yeah. believe in Jesus. Mm, not on DMs, no. No, not no, that no. I know of. No, no, no. Yeah, I find that I always find that really interesting. Yeah. I mean, I get it. I get an assortment of other comments from friends who, who you know, don't have the same uh, religious background or spiritual background as me, mm -hmm. uh, which I always find really unique. Yeah. And I always laugh and, and tell mm -hmm. you, and then I try to explain the best that mm -hmm. I can to my friends, kind of maybe the nuances of of growing up in church and being a part of a church and then having mm -hmm. started a church, and and that it's not um, as glamorous as they would like to make it seem. You yeah. know, well, I have gotten some negative response from people who are now atheists who used to quote be Christians. Or used to go to church. Right, right. But I, mean, I always see it as people who are just really angry. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. I mean, it's 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 it it is a really interesting thing. Uh, people's criticism, and I will say this: I think we've done a better job at, of how we respond. And I will say we, as in me, because <laughs> I just don't engage anymore in it. Yes. And I I tried to keep uh, a lot of that just separate from my mm -hmm. from from my personal space, mostly for my mental health. Mm -hmm. I think people don't realize how much negative comments really do fuel a lot of bitterness and mm -hmm. that's just poison for your soul yeah. and my soul had had enough and i find it ironic when certain actors or certain celebrities or certain people on blogs or even people who like i don't know why but the mosaic google reviews go to me like they go to some old email I have, I've had. So I get pinged on it cuz i think i was like part of the team that did the initial like social mm -hmm. media with the websites and everything. 
So I get a ping that, you know, so every time there's a negative review mm -hmm. and it's usually someone random and that has never been here. And you look at the other reviews they make and there's like all negative reviews everywhere <laughs> they go. But one guy left a review that was like, I've never been there, but this is what I think they are. And I was like, my man, like I've had those too. Yeah. I've never been there, but this is who you are. Yeah. I don't know who said it. I don't know if it was Tom Holland or mm -hmm. Mel Gibson or Shia LaBeouf or someone who is, you know, has received hate. Quite a few people have requoted it. I know what you're going to say. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. if you don't have my number, I mean, it might have been Tom Hardy. No. If you don't have my number, if you, if you don't have my number, you don't know me well enough to hate me. Is that what it was? Yeah, I think it was Batman. Christian Bale. Yes. Ah, it was Christian Bale. Christian Bale. So what Austin said basically is that it's like, if you have a problem with me, you can call me. And if you don't have my number, I don't, you don't know me well enough to have a problem with me. Right. I feel exactly the same. <laughs> I really do. But I really want to hone in on what that woman said, because I think one of two things. I think we could, we could focus in on the, the obvious topic of hypocrisy, mm -hmm. that oftentimes we are more willing to point out what's wrong with the other person than we are willing to point out what's wrong with ourselves. Mm -hmm. So I think if we're going to grow in life, you have to first look at what is wrong with yourself before you go and tell someone what's yeah. wrong with them, right? Mm -hmm. And oftentimes I find that it does not matter how close you are with that person, people don't want to hear what's wrong with them, right? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, one, it's like, how do you engage in a relationship with someone or a conversation with someone where you go, can I give you real feedback, mm -hmm. you know? And then how do you as that person go, okay, I'm in a space to receive that feedback mm -hmm. or no, I'm not don't give it to me right now, save it for a later date. Mm -hmm. But in these situations, what's, what do you think, what do you think spurs a person across the world to take a moment of their life and waste it? Because let me be very clear, you are wasting your life mm -hmm. by sending negative energy comments, propaganda, lies, truth, Mm -hmm. Why? Why is it your job? Well, the line that really did catch me, and I think it's probably going to be the name of this podcast, is make your life count. It is absolutely going to be the name of this podcast. And, you know, because that's what she said to me, make your life count. Yeah. And then, of course, the indictment there is my life isn't counting. My life doesn't count. Yeah. Let's count it. Let's count how many books you've released. Let's count number 12. Make your life count. This is the 12th <laughs> one. The 12th one. There's 12 counts. I, this I, is just it. No, no. On top of it, there's 12 books. On top of that, there's about 52 messages a year for the last 30 years. I don't know the math, Austin, but that's probably about 17 million. And <laughs> on top of that, when you've ever done anything good for this earth, then reach out and let us know how you made it count. But sorry, let's, that was just a tangent. Well, let's, let's go into it. I, one, I want to I just be so clear. When someone, a complete stranger, reaches out across the world and says to me, make your life count. It really does affect me. But it, why? Um, Someone who means nothing to you. I know. It, and I think it's because um, years ago, I came to this realization that every day I disappoint someone. Interesting. And no matter how hard you try, no matter how much you do, uh, no matter how much you try to have a, a moral compass that is honorable and noble and has integrity, every day you disappoint someone. Yeah. And I had to grapple with that years and years ago. And I, uh, in fact, at, at um, my birthday party, we we're having this conversation with several doctors and and they, and one of my our friends uh, say was like, you know, I mean, he's a doctor. He goes, I don't have any empathy. He goes, I don't think I have any empathy at all. And this other guy, Edward, who runs a, a, um, a human development company goes, I definitely don't have any empathy. In fact, they told me that the part of my brain that's supposed to have empathy doesn't work. Oh, wow. <laughs> and uh, and then I'm like, when I went to the Gallup Leadership Center 20 years ago, I had the highest score in empathy that they'd ever recorded. I had a perfect score. Yeah. And uh, so I feel everything, and which is kind of an odd dilemma because if you know things like the Myers Briggs, I'm a thinking, not a feeling, and so I I'm a I make decisions based on goals and objectives, but I feel everything. So I live in this internal yeah. tension. And so I, I do feel things deeply. And when someone says that, make your life count, I feel the judgment of it. And, and I've had to develop over the years the discipline of not allowing that to shape me because I, I, I have to identify for what it is. It is manipulation. It is a person trying to make you do what they want you to do through shame. It's interesting. 
And 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 one of the things that I I have had to like repeat to myself over the years is do not live a life of obligation, live a life of intention. And over the decades, people have asked me, when did you feel your life shift? And I said, when I stopped living a life of obligation and started living a life of intention. And no matter how much you do it, and this is the reality. Uh, and this other guy who sent me, you know, this horrific, you know, DM and comment. Do you because, think he was a real account or do you think he was just like a bot? No, like I think he's a real account. guy. Yeah. And he said, 20 years ago, I heard you, you know, and, and you know, what has happened to you? And it was really derogatory. And I realized, oh, people say you've changed, but what they really don't like is that you've grown. Yeah. They want you to be the same person that they needed you to be at some point in their life. And the only reason someone would say something to me like make your life count is because they're living, uh, what's that, vicariously through me. Mm -hmm. And so what I'm not doing, what they should be doing, I'm letting them down because they're living vicariously through me. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you've said it, I just want to yeah. pause. You've said a few really important things. You talked mm -hmm. about it, this idea of like living your life out of intention versus obligation, yeah. right? So many of us live our lives out of obligation versus intention. Yeah. We live our life going, I feel guilted and shamed by the world that I, or the ecosystem that I exist within, whether it's mm -hmm. family, friends, work, responsibility, children, mm -hmm. all of the, you know, f church people, religious organizations, whatever it may be, maybe within the construct of, I grew up and I always wanted to be a doctor and I don't want to be a doctor anymore. Right. Right. right, the inability to pull the parachute and go, I need to try something new. There was a doctor in a house who just resigned. She quit being a doctor. Really? And is reinventing her life. She does. I don't think she knows what she's going to do next. She just knows she's no longer a doctor. When you, <laughs> I, I think the only people who can do that are people like that. <laughs> who like, I've already achieved, I've gone to this mm -hmm. place where I've gone, okay, I've done this. Mm -hmm. And now let me go and do something else and achieve something else. Yeah. But I would say this, because you talked about this in our Rihanna, uh, our Rihanna call. <laughs> our arena call. Wow. Ooh. Ooh. We'd have more people if it was a Rihanna call. It would, we'd have a lot more people on a Rihanna <laughs> the, call. Your arena call. But the arena is growing nicely. It's wonderful. And I really love it. And if you're contemplating joining, you should join. We do a call every Monday. We do some bonus calls as well. Mm -hmm. But today's call, you, you said something that really impacted me. You talked about uh, how you have a few anchors in your life. Mm -hmm. they, we were talking about risk and, and taking risks and uh, quantitative risks and how to be a deliberate person, but also how to be a risk-taking person. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, if, if you're too deliberate, how to be more risk-taking. If you're too risk-taking, how to be more deliberate and, mm -hmm. and team and pair with those people. Kind of the, the difference between integrators and visionaries. Mm -hmm. uh, but you mentioned something. You're like, I'm very high risk-taking, but I've lived in the same house for the last 12 years. Mm -hmm. And before that, I think 15 years, the last mm -hmm. house before that. You have been, you've been married to the same woman for, you know. 40 years. 40 years. Mm -hmm. And you've been a part of Mosaic and leading at Mosaic for, for 30, 30 years. years. Yeah. You're like my, you're like, I have anchored parts of my life that mm -hmm. keep me very foundationally sound. I risk, I take risks in my businesses. I take mm -hmm. risks in your, your own career and the way mm -hmm. you, you speak and in the, your messaging. Mm -hmm. But how important is that for you? And why is that necessary for you? Well, I, I do think it's important to have anchors. Those things that are non-negotiable in your life. And that um, no matter what, uh, you're committed to them. And uh, and if you're very clear about them, you're able to risk everything else. If you're not clear on them, you will become super tight control. You'll hold on to everything because you don't know what your anchors are. I think that's me. Mm. I really think that's me. Yeah. Not to make this about me, <laughs> but I am the only other person on this podcast today. <laughs> but I've been really struggling with that because mm. I feel that when I've made certain mistakes or feel like I can't... <laughs> get back mm -hmm. the momentum that I've had with its relationships, mm -hmm. friendships, business, my personal life, I start operating out of a place of such insecurity. Yeah. But really the insecurity is the fact that I feel so insecure with my situation. I feel out of control. Yeah. So then I start trying to control everything. And also, then I- what? if you don't have anchors, you start becoming what you think everyone else wants you to be. Okay. Man, so you do have to have anchors in your life going, these are my non-negotiables of who I am and how I live my life. Okay. And, and that's why, you know, I mean, on the arena, I was talking about like my core anchor is Jesus and my life is always, uh, um, an expression of Jesus at my center. It doesn't mean it's going to be the way other people want it to look. I mean, one of the big criticisms I've gotten is, uh, so many of your posts on Instagram are about personal development. Why aren't you talking about Jesus? I do not feel a moral or spiritual obligation for every one of my conversations to be about Jesus. 
I think that's for people who are insecure about their faith. In fact, I actually don't trust people who only talk about Jesus. Hmm. I got to be honest with you. When I hear people are only talking about hyper spiritual things, uh, I feel there's something off hmm. in their life. And I, I like other things in life. I love sports. I, I love science. I love politics. I, I, I love talking about an endless number of arenas in life. And everything in my life is informed out of my relationship with Jesus, but every, every conversation doesn't have to be about Jesus. Yeah. And um, Jesus doesn't demand that of me or require that of me. It's people who demand that and require that. I do find that when I'm in my healthiest space, mental health wise mm -hmm. and personal -wise, personally, um, in the, the way that I'm living my life, I'm able to talk about any subject within like my purview yeah. at any time. Mm -hmm. You want to talk about personal life? Okay, I can talk about it. It doesn't give me too much anxiety. It doesn't bring too much stress. I'm excited about this. Yeah. You, if, if I'm in a good place with work, I'm excited to talk about work. You want to, yeah. if, if you have criticism for me, I can receive the criticism. Mm -hmm. But I feel that oftentimes when we bring our most negative selves, and I feel lately I've been really negative. I was really negative at the football game yesterday because I tried to talk about work and then you were like not having it. And <laughs> and then the Rams started losing and then I started losing. And, and but I, I feel that when I try to force conversations, it's when I'm in my own unhealthy space. Mm -hmm. So how do you manage your, or how do you become self-aware enough to go, okay, I'm on a slippery slope of slow decline. <laughs> <laughs> how do I make adjustments? And and like for me, I, I, I listened to a snippet of a podcast and it was a, a doctor and he was talking about how he um, encourages his patients to take three times a day, 25 deep breaths. Mm -hmm. He's like, when you wake up, just mm -hmm. take 25 deep breaths, get the oxygen flowing in your brain. Mm -hmm. uh, Andrew Huberman talks about, mm -hmm. he's like, uh, like panic control, you know, take three big breaths, inhales, and then hold them and then release them and bring your heart rate back down. He's like, there's human, you know, hacks uh, to control those moments. But for you, how what's the posture in which to like become more self-aware? Well, I think those are different questions, right? Becoming what, not self to have anxiety and security and lack and of becoming self-aware. Well, no, I think because you know. before you understand those things, if not everyone has those people who can see them, you yeah. know, see the other person really clearly, how do I know when I'm in a healthy space? I, I mean, I, I think that the best feedback mechanism of whether you're in a healthy space is how you relate to other people. Okay. And, you know, if you're treating people with kindness and with grace, with patience, it's an expression that you're in a healthy place. When you're treating people with impatience or harshness or um, even brutality, you're in an unhealthy space. I think how you relate to other people is the singular best measure of whether you're in a healthy place or not. And okay. Because it's, it's how we get to see what's inside of us, you know? Yeah. And... Um, it's also how you take control of your world. If, if you want to begin to take control of your internal world, then you have to get to a place where you're not reacting or responding to your external world. Mm. The healthier your internal world is, the less effect the external world has on you. Okay. And the more unhealthy your internal world is, the more your internal world is completely dependent on what's going on around you. Okay. And you know, and so in my life, when I feel myself stressing out or feeling overwhelmed, I, um, I detach and I go inward and I give myself permission to pay attention to what's going on inside of me before I interact. So I may just take off and go for a walk or I might disappear for a little while or, and, and get myself recalibrated, you know, okay. and, and sometimes you don't get that luxury. No, no. And, I, I, you sent me a clip of um, Derek Carr. I'm not sure. He was teaching the other quarterback, Tatum. I'm not sure. That he. Oh, yeah. Oh, no, he's teaching someone in, like, a, someone in the, on the team, on the offense. Yeah. Because offensive, offensive Derek squad. Carr is now with the Saints, Saints, right? He's with the Saints, yeah. And Tatum's with the Saints, and he's like the, the super athlete who also plays quarterback. Okay. And then he's saying, What? What's in your ears? And he goes, Yeah, I block out the noise. Mm. But you got to find out is how to block out the noise. 
And, and, and sometimes you can't leave the room. Sometimes you're stuck on the field. Sometimes the stadium is screaming and you have to find a way to block out all the noise. Yeah. Right. And sometimes blocking out the, out the noise um, when you don't have the luxury of leaving the noise right. is um, getting to a place where you just focus internally. And sometimes it can be um, a phrase you can repeat to yourself that, that gets yourself recentered, you know, or sometimes it can just, it can be like taking slow, deep breaths to get yourself centered, but you have to find some way to block out the noise from the outside world. And uh, that's why you see a lot of like athletes pull a towel over their head. Like they're just blocking out all the noise or they uh, will put on headsets, you know, and listen to music because they're blocking out the noise. So you have to have a way to pull a towel over your head without a towel. And, and, and usually for me, it's, um, I just block everything out even though I'm in the room. <laughs> yeah. And I just start going into my head and thinking through what I need to do, what's really important, what really matters. And then on, on the big scale, um, I have to remind myself what actually motivates me. I realize things like um, on a scale of one to 10, making money is like a one to a two for me. Like I am just not motivated when I think, oh, I need to make more money. But I'm highly motivated when I go, oh, I need to make a greater impact on the world. And, uh, and which is connected to making money, yeah. you know, and it's not always, but it, it has a huge connection because if it's not self if it's not self-sustaining, you're always dependent on someone else to make it happen. Hmm. And, and I really believe in things that should be self-sustaining. Hmm. I don't like asking other people for money. I don't want to be dependent on someone else's success so that I can be successful. And so if that's the case, then you have to do things that actually merit their own value. Hmm. And, and so then that, that motivates me. You know, it motivates me to create things that actually have such intrinsic value that it pays for itself. Okay. Like a book. Like I spent my life learning the concepts in this book. And someone's going to pay 25 bucks for it. To me, what they're getting in the book is worth immensely more than the $25. Hmm. I have no psychological or ethical problem with this book selling in a bookstore and someone buying it. In fact, I think it's the best decision they can make to spend $25 to get a lifetime of insight and wisdom to know how to live their life most fully. And, 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 I, and in fact, sometimes when people do things like, hey, I'm giving away every, all the profit from every book. Yeah. I go, don't do that because you're diminishing the value of that book for every other author and every other writer. Oh, I just don't buy their book. <laughs> I know I, I, if you're giving away the proceeds, I, it's a guarantee. I don't need your, your secondary, gen, I don't need you to be generous for me. I'm generous. Mm -hmm. So if I'm buying your book, there has to bring value, not more generosity, which is a weird thing. But mm -hmm. it's why I never like Tom's, but not in a mean way, because I like Blake, but I don't, mm -hmm. I didn't like the idea of Tom's because I'm like, no, no, like, let's just give because we want to give, not because it incentivizes us to buy. And I know. And we, yeah, both, call we, that and we both felt the right. same way for years and years about things like, because people, when yes. we were in fashion, people say, hey, let's do a two for one or let's do a, yeah. a, a part of this money goes yeah, to yeah. Um, a project. And, I, and we go, that's a marketing tool that yeah, you're yeah. using a person's desire to buy and their desire to be altruistic and go, oh, if you buy this, it counts as generosity. Yeah. And to me, like I'm, I'm a hyper generous person, but I don't ever want to pretend I'm buying something that I want because I'm a generous person. Yeah. I'm going to be generous when I'm generous. I'm going to buy that pair of shoes because I want it, <laughs> you right. know, and yeah, I don't yeah. need an excuse for that. Right. But I, I think there's a mentality and I'm, I'm only using this as an example uh, of how do I get back into the right space. Right. I remind myself what actually motivates me. Yeah. And I realize, oh, um, if, I, if I misalign why I like doing things, why I love doing things, I stop loving it. Hmm. If I remember why I'm doing it, like um, we do this podcast, but for me, it's like my drive is actually to help people think better. Yes. Like I actually have a deep longing to end stupid thinking. Yeah, <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, yeah. I feel like it's a personal yeah. calling in my life. I want to <laughs> violate a person's view of reality. I want to destroy internal yeah. limitations. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I feel that a part of my mission in life 
is to elevate the way humans think. Yeah. And, uh, and so that motivates me for the podcast. What really, it's terrible, but it doesn't motivate me when I go, oh, we have more listeners. They should because more listeners means more <laughs> brains that are functioning better, right? More, you know, so when we talk about how do we grow the podcast, I can feel myself shrinking. And I know I have a dysfunctional relationship between sales and reality. Yeah. And I just, uh, and I, you know, I listen to a lot of my friends who are great at sales. I mean, some of them are like masters. They're Kung Fu masters in sales. And they always say, if you hate sales, you, you have wrong thinking. And I listen to them, I go, I do have wrong thinking. Yeah. And because I do hate sales. Yeah. And, but every one of them, they believe in the value of their product. They believe in the value yeah. of what they're selling. Yeah. And I realized, I, I, I told Kim this, I said, it's crazy for me. I listen to people that I really love and they'll go, this is the greatest book ever written. You need to buy it, it'll change your life. And I'm like, it's okay. It's an okay book, you know, and, and it might change something in your life. But when they say it, they're not lying. They, they believe it with every fiber of their being. And for my first five books, this is how I would sell it. You don't really need this book. The only book you need is the Bible, but you know. it's so crazy. That's how I know people who call you out for not talking about Jesus are actually trash human beings because and I mean that. I don't like calling people trash human beings. You know that. I mean, I don't mean they're trash. I mean, it's like like the quality of their human is low. <laughs> the thinking. No, but even just the reality, because I'm like, my whole life I've been trying to, I, I, I've listened to you talk about Jesus. Like mm -hmm. when we're sitting on the couch playing, like we do this thing right now, where we're both on chess.com and we're watching yeah. football or something. We're playing chess against each other next to each <laughs> other. <laughs> we could just play on the chessboard that's yeah. right in front of us. But we were talking, we talk about God all of the time. Mm -hmm. You just don't talk about it in a dumb enough way. And I'm sorry to say it like that, but the reality is you don't, the irony when people say mosaic is like a, um, a uh, what is it, like a baby Christian church and we need something deeper. I'm like, no, actually, it's that you don't understand what's happening here. And that there's such a level of both um, onboarding people who want to learn about something that's so uniquely different mm -hmm. than what they're used to and also something with such depth and quality that it, we, it it's un incomparable mm -hmm. you know and so just because something looks shallow or looks fresh or looks like something that's simple to eat doesn't mean or digest does not mean that that is not complex mm -hmm. and that's something that we learned at noma was yeah. that you'd have these like little slivers of mushroom mm -hmm. and there'd be like eight different processes that singular piece of fruit or mm -hmm. vegetable went through before it ever touches your lips yeah. and i'm like that's the beauty of the message you bring mm -hmm. and it's the way that and also you look at the bible you look at jesus he was so simple mm -hmm. he, sometimes he was a little too complex and <laughs> And maybe not he, so he simple. He was not simplistic though, but it was simple. It was elegant. It was elegant and it was, um, yeah. 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 Yeah, it's just like for all the years when I would do speaking here, I'd have people say to me, hey, what people need is meat and potatoes. What people need is meat and potatoes. And, yeah. and I knew what they were saying was, um, you're, you're not giving us what we need. The, it, it's not simple enough, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, and it's sort of like the irony of, I, I, don't remember, I don't know where I saw this, but someone said, hey, maybe it's a con. Maybe we think sushi is like a delicacy, but the chef's too lazy to cook the food. It's so crazy. <laughs> and I, I actually think that I spent my life trying to teach what is the equivalent of sushi. It's an elegant, thoughtful preparation that looks uncooked to you, but it's actually a higher grade of food. Yes. And it um, does not need avocado. <laughs> My favorite thing, this is a shout out to our boy Jesse in Australia, because when he came out to visit us and he's a part of our mastermind, but he he couldn't end up making the dates that we did our mastermind and, and he came out and visited us like a month ago. And we, we took him to you took him to a, we took him to a sushi spot. I didn't know he didn't. And 
And I, I forget like that Aussies don't really eat sushi. He they, told me he likes like, sushi. They eat rolls. And it, a lot of times it's like it's like chicken and avocado rolls and like different things like that. And I was like, Things oh, that are not sushi. I think dog, you're about to go on a <laughs> wild ride right now. <laughs> He's eating eel. Like, and you ordered like the gnarliest, like most experimental menu. And I was like, oh, we should have just given him the most relaxed one. But, I feel so bad. We <laughs> just should have gotten them California rolls. <laughs> I know, I know. And But it was one of those moments where it was like, it really is a great example and metaphor for what you you do because if you ever seen hero dreams of sushi mm -hmm. you know the different places serve the same thing the quality and the understanding of the quality comes from the freshness of the fish the cutting it mm -hmm. at the right time the way you cut it the, the 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 size and mass and weight in which you cut it and i think that's a really special thing i went to a, a sushi spot two weeks ago and I, I think i called you the next day being like yo you have to go to mm -hmm. this place and it was a treat. It was a night out. It was nice. It was more expensive than I would have preferred for sushi to be. <laughs> but literally every piece, you don't get to say a single thing. And they actually blacked out the um, the sushi bar. So you're sitting at the sushi bar and you can't see what they're making. It's just chef's choice. And you're kind of similar to that. <laughs> if someone says, I want meat and potatoes, you're giving them French fries. Not even French fries. No, you're not giving them French fries. You're giving them like some ice car go. You're like, here's a snail sir and you're welcome <laughs> you genuinely give people things uh a taste you give people a taste of something they never knew they needed yeah and i think the w the reality is that and i think this comes full circle back to that woman in australia is that people oftentimes don't even realize they're missing something in life mm -hmm. and it's an untasted experience it's a new frequency it's a new way of talking about something and I think for us to shut everything down that w is unfamiliar and to say that it doesn't meet our expectation because it doesn't speak the way that we feel comfortable and doesn't encourage us in the way we need it, we have to be more open and more willing to hear new things and to see things in a new way. Yeah. And I love that because on the, on the arena, we have like a kid who is 18 years old and a freshman <laughs> in college. And Caleb, who's wonderful. And then we got guys who were in their like 60s and 70s mm -hmm. and they're interacting. Yeah. And I'm looking at it and I'm going, the common denominator between these two people is that one is young enough to see that he doesn't know everything, which I think is really wise to yeah. know at 18 and to go, I need this a part of my life. Mm -hmm. And I remember because I, I leaked my number when we launched the art of communication. Mm -hmm. And he was one of the first kids that called me and FaceTimed me wow. on my number. And was like, hey, I'm like 16 or I think he must have been 16 at the time, 17. He's like, but I want to, I need the communication. Can I do this with my mom? And I was like, well, technically no, but yes, you can, because <laughs> I think I love you as a human. You're just amazing. <laughs> and then we've got guys in there who are older and wiser and have done big things in their life. Mm -hmm. And they're going, I still want to think in a fresh way. Mm -hmm. And I think it's remarkable when you see a community that goes, I'm up for the unknown. Yeah, <laughs> it's funny we mentioned that. Someone, I saw a photograph, they're in the arena and they're using it for homeschooling. <laughs> Are they? The, the whole family is there. <laughs> and I'm like, I can't repost that because that's technically. No, no, no. I don't think you were homeschooling their kids. I think she was homeschooling them and but taking the call. No, they're all on the arena taking notes and okay. learning. And that's crazy. And so I'm like, I saw that photo. Technically, you're not supposed to be doing that, but. I kind of love it, so I'm, I'm not going to shout it out in a negative way. I, I think it's pretty cool. That's funny. But um, but uh, all this to say, because, you know, we're, we're kind of rambling yeah, through this a little yeah. bit, but... Um, this is us, though. This is what we do. <clears throat> yeah, no, and it's, I think it's good. I, I, I do think that, one, if you're going to pursue your highest intention, you will disappoint people you will not live up to their expectations. If you're going to keep growing, then you're gonna keep changing. And there'll be people who will not approve because they want you, they need you to be who you were because they still are who they were. Mm. And, um, and, and, and it, sometimes it frustrates me because the, the thinking is so bad, I don't know how to fix it. But when I, when I go to my dentist and he says, hey, you, you need, or you have a cavity or whatever, or you mm. need a root canal. I don't say, yeah, but what does the Bible have to say about it? I just go, okay, how much is that going to cost and how painful is it going to be? And what's the recovery time? When you have electrical problems in your house, you call the best electrician you can, 
you ask them for an assessment, they give you an evaluation, and then you don't go to them, yeah, but what does Jesus have to say about the electrical problem? For some reason. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. Jesus never had electricity. <laughs> I never thought about that, Aaron. Yeah. Well, you, maybe you should. This is like a breakthrough moment. Maybe you need to make your life count. <laughs> I'm sorry. So Jesus actually has nothing to say about electricity. No, nothing. In fact, <laughs> he never even saw it. Except that he was 100% electrical. Yeah, okay. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to put, someone's going to put that on a shirt and you just ruined Christianity. Oh, sorry. I When the woman touched Jesus' robe, it says she felt, he felt his power leave him. Wow. And so side note, but my whole point is that so he had remote charging before that ever it ever <laughs> so steve jobs really got remote charging from jesus wow i'm sorry i'm taking it to a dark place no no keep going the, the, my whole point of this is that when i see responses like um what does the bible have to say about that uh, on the post on overthinking for some reason christians need things to be so canned that it feels undeniably christian Mm -hmm. rather than undeniably true. And it makes me wonder if what we want is the security of what we know, quote, rather than the transformational power of what we need to know. Okay. And, you know, when, when I'm studying physics or looking at neuroscience or... Um, looking at aspects of botany or biology because I'm looking for insights. I assume that every truth in nature is a truth that has the fingerprint of God on it. I don't have to say, oh, and Jesus made this plant. And I think a huge part of why thinking is so shallow is that we are more comforted by cliches than we are by truth. And I just made a commitment, one, at Mosaic, I would never use cliches that we would dive into things that were real and true and authentic and that our language would never um, be so superficial that it would sound trite and, um, or empty. And but you did, we were on a trip this last yeah. week. And we were hanging out with Ryan Pineda, and that guy's awesome. I really yeah. like him. If you don't know who he is, you should you should look him up on YouTube or, or Instagram. I got introduced to him, I think, on Instagram or TikTok. Yeah. And then I think one of his team reached out to you, yeah. and then you were busy because it was like Easter week. And I was like, "No, what are you doing? We have to do this <laughs> podcast." It's he's he's re I I really like him. He's he's a real estate guy in, in Vegas, out of Nevada, mm -hmm. and in beautiful family, but. You were telling him, you're like, you know, we're very different, very different. I, I pulled your side and I was like, why you gotta tell everybody we're so different than everybody? They don't know we're different. <laughs> Let them like us and then figure out we're different later. <laughs> but, but you do feel the need to distance our, us from the rest of the Christian world at times. I do. Yeah. Yes. It's yeah. because I, um, I have an uncomfortable relationship to the way Christianity is expressed. I find a great deal of it to be inauthentic. And I find a significant of it, uh, it to be very shallow when it's thinking. And it's, it's disturbing to me. Yeah. And, and oh, I've had that dilemma. I, I'm just going to be honest. I mean, I, I cannot deny who Jesus is because of who he is and how he's changed my life. Um, I've never, ever felt like I fit into Christianity as a culture. Hmm. And, and, and so because of that, I live in this great tension. Yeah, I mean, we've, we've had that conversation many times yeah. where I'm like, isn't it better to have friends that you don't agree with than to have no friends at all? Absolutely. You know, because we were really, <laughs> we were so on an island for such a long time yeah. that it became okay, well, we have to, we have to build a bridge yeah. to let people on our island, Yeah, you know, and it's okay. Yeah. And, and, you know, the way I've adjusted over time is, uh, cause Kim, you know, has asked me, you, you used to never do stuff like this, or you used to, you wouldn't go to events like this or be with this kind of like group. And I go, honey, you know, I've just accepted the fact that this is what it is. Yeah. 
you, yeah. you know, and um, it's, you know, if I'm on a Zoom call and, and uh, with all these Christians and suddenly everybody like starts speaking tongues on Zoom, I'm like, I'm weirded out. Yeah, yeah. You know, but I just accept yeah. the fact that it's authentic and real to them. Yeah. And, uh, and, and I just try to move through life without judgment. When I hear all of a sudden people, because I, you know, I go to a lot of Christian business stuff and I thought, oh, it's going to be more of a business space. But it's really very, very Christian. And all of a sudden people are on stage going, and God said this, and God said this, and God said this, and God told me this, and God told me this. Like my authenticity meter just breaks yeah and i go yeah i mean yesterday i was listening to someone and he was like and then god told me this and then god told me this and i'm like he didn't and um but did you dm him and said no i didn't to, to make his life count no i didn't I, I thought what a wonderful feeling it must be to feel that god said those things to you like yeah you, you know and and it i believe god speaks that's the crazy thing yeah, yeah. i do believe god speaks to us but I think the moment you're on stage and you're using your your opinions and your thoughts as the equivalent of God speaking to everyone, um, you're in a dangerous place. And you know, I would I would much rather like take a posture of humility and go, "Hey, this is what I think, or this is what I see." Well, how would you, you know? adjust that language? Would you, if you were telling that story, would you say? Because I've 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 heard you talk about the moments you felt like God spoke to you. Yeah. So would you, I would say in your deeply spiritual moments, you handle them with great care, mm -hmm. you know? And one thing I think you've always taught me to, to in a, the way that I would use that language was, and I said this the other day too, I think my friend McLaren, I said, I very rarely, oh, I think I actually said it to, to Kevin at dinner on Friday. I said, you know me, I don't talk like this. Mm -hmm. But I said, I feel like what God has told me about your life is this. Mm -hmm. And it was very small. It wasn't like yeah. some big, thing over which is like I feel like maybe this is mm -hmm. the thing that God's revealed about you to me mm -hmm. and if that's not true that's fine and I'm not trying to like make this this thing that you need to think about but I was just like I feel like this is an insight I have and we talked about it for an hour you know and and I didn't use I didn't say it in God's name at first mm -hmm. I first just tried to say it and then I was like wait no no I think I actually have something that I has been revealed to me mm -hmm. and maybe it's just from our friendship maybe it's from mm -hmm. maybe it's just the the friction or like the you know the, the the encouragement of each other but so how do you handle that with care because i think that's such an important thing because i think we, then i think we can go back into how do you handle criticism with care like how do you critique in a healthy way yeah one thing i have to remind myself of is that i'm probably way more patient and gracious to people who i completely disagree with okay <laughs> and uh, you know and so yeah. if a person's an atheist i'm really gracious if a person is a Hindu or a Muslim or a Buddhist, I am the most gracious, unjudgmental person. <laughs> You're so wild in that regard because if I don't if I don't like you, I don't care what you are. I just don't like you. If you are rude, I'm going to be rude back. <laughs> and it's not a great posture. But if you're a Christian, I tend to be less patient. You are brutal. And, and it's, it's I have to remind you, like, hey, they're on our team. Yeah. Like, and they like us. And so I recognize that, I, you know, one, I am 65 now, so I'm probably not going to uh, change, change. <laughs> too much on this one. Okay. But but I am trying to become more gracious. And uh, and in almost every Q&A where we go in this Christian <laughs> space, I have to remind you before, remember, the first person who has the questions, don't kill that person. Don't destroy that human being. He actually <laughs> likes you. He's asking a question because he wants to hear from you. Yes, and I realized that. Because you used to have a tendency to flame every first question. <laughs> yeah, it's true because I would listen to the question and go, if I answer this question, I'm affirming really bad thinking. And so then I ended up breaking down the bad thinking rather than dealing with the sincerity of the question. So yes, I, I feel like um, I could have done a much better job over the years and uh, with <laughs> with that and um but it's an interesting yeah. thing because you never attack the character of the person no or the or you attack the question i do i see questions as something out here i see thinking ideas out here and i don't ever think of it as attacking of a person and uh, because like when i have an idea or a thought 
it's, it's out here. And if someone attacks it, I don't feel like they're attacking me. Hmm. But I realize other people don't feel that way. When you attack an idea, that person feels like they're being attacked, which I should know. I've been married for 40 years to Kim. And any idea she has, if you attack the idea, you're attacking her. If you don't like the idea, you don't like her. Yeah, if you're yeah. against the idea, you're against her. Yeah. So there's no separation between yeah. my wife and her ideas. Yeah. And, but I always related more to myself because I have thousands of ideas. <laughs> so I expect most of them to be bad. And yeah. uh, some of them we do get accepted. We ideas like popcorn. Yeah. And you're like, no. And you're like, no. <laughs> we're, very, we're very black and white in that way. And you're like, oh, maybe that one. Let me sit with it. You yeah. know? But some people are very attached to their ideas. Yeah. But going full circle and maybe extracting some good insights um, from this is, um, one, I think that we need to be careful not to project on other people our disappointments about our own lives. Mm. And I, I've had to come to realize that most of the criticism I get um, from people that don't know me are because I am a projection of the life they feel they should live. And if I'm not meeting that projection, I disappoint them. Yeah. Two, I can't live my life based on the approval or disappointment of other people. Yeah. I have to, uh, and now what's happened to me is as, as I listen to all these critiques, I go, see, Mind Shift is a social psychology book. Hmm. I made sure it was not a Christian book. I wrote this book and I purposely made it a social psychology book. You do not have to believe in God or Jesus to read this book and extricate the principles and apply them to your life. On the back here, there's a barcode, and this barcode tells bookstores where this book goes. And for years, I have fought with my publishers and said, please don't put a barcode that says Christian section or Christian life or right. faith. Because people don't even realize that. When that gets scanned at a bookstore yeah. on Amazon, it goes into a specific category. Right. right. And I have fought this for every one of my books, even the genius of Jesus. I did not want the genius of Jesus in the Christian section. I want it in the section that uh, we're um, thinking like Leonardo da Vinci was in and or, book, or books on the principles taught by Buddha or. Right. Um, and with this book, it's, it's a social psychology book. It's a leadership management book. It's, it's in the secular section. So if you go to the Christian section, you will not find this book. But if you go to the self-development, business management, um, leadership, you're going to find this book. And I want it in that section because I think that that's where we're supposed to be in the conversation. The challenge is that um, so much of Christian culture says, if you're not in the Christian section, you've abandoned the faith. And I'm like, if you're in the Christian section, you're actually simply trying to monetize on people who agree with you and believe with you. Mm -hmm. I'm actually trying to engage in a conversation with people who are outside of the faith and help people who are inside of the faith. Because in, in the same way with that woman who sent me that DM, she does listen to Tony Robbins or Mel Robbins or hmm. um, Gary Vee or um, whoever else might be out there, you know, and um, because it's an odd thing. We think, or oh, Jesus is for our faith, but all these other experts are for life, which is exactly why I've moved more in this space, because I want people to know that if you actually believe in Jesus, and if you actually build your life on the scriptures, you have the best insights for how to live your life. That's a clip right there. I love it, sorry. Yeah. I had to guide direct sometimes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I think the book of Ecclesiastes Solomon is known as the wisest man who ever lived. And I don't think Ecclesiastes has the word God in it. it I don't think it Solomon. Definitely doesn't have Jesus in it. Definitely doesn't have Jesus because <laughs> before Jesus. And I don't think Solomon talks about God. Well, it's okay. The lady in Australia, she told me she's been trying to DM Solomon for the last <laughs> five years. Couldn't find him on Instagram. You checking it out, Austin? So is that the one time? Yeah, maybe once. Okay. And um, and um, me begins by saying everything's meaningless. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know? meaningless, meaningless, and, and meaningless, he, meaningless. And then he has all these principles about life, but the principles aren't, quote, God-centered principles. He actually says things that are incredibly 
profound in the business space, in the leadership space, in the culture space. Mm. And I love that. But it's because his whole life, all of his wisdom is informed by God. And it's, that's the irony, is that if I wrote a book on physics, I wouldn't suddenly be godless. Right. It, you know, if I wrote a book on engineering, I would not suddenly be godless. If I'm writing a book on human principles for optimal performance, you're not suddenly godless. And what I hope I can, I, 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 in fact, I want to fight this battle. I want Christians to start thinking and communicating and writing in such a way that it's the best of the best in every domain and that it's so extraordinary that people then go back, where did you learn this? What informed your thinking? Mm. I, I want the highest quality of thinking to be what informs people about our faith. Mm. I love that. I love that. How to, how, to, how to make your life count. This is a good topic. Make your life count by not being controlled by the expectations of others. Do not allow shame and guilt to define who you are. Elevate to your highest level. You hold yourself accountable to being the person God created you to be. And don't let anyone else's definition of who you are limit your definition of who you are. Amazing, I love it. I'm gonna steal your book from you real quick. Uh, this is a commercial <laughs> for, I believe, one of the greatest books of 2023. And I think one of your best written books and you have some phenomenally written books. I would say each book each book gets better and better. But this is a, this is a special one to me. I'm really excited. You have an incredible incredible lineup of people who have recommended this book, um, including Lewis Howes, Dre, Dre Lorenzo, Jamie Lee Kern, uh, Jamie Kern Lima, Ed Millette, Sean McVeigh. Uh, shout out to our guys on the Rams. They Jerry fought, Lorenzo. Jerry Lorenzo. They fought brilliantly yesterday. The Rams mm -hmm. did. I thought they took on the 49ers pretty well. Yeah. Um, but I'm really excited. This release is October 3rd. You can you can pre-order it now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, pretty much everywhere books are sold. And this book will come, and I'm very excited. I cannot wait. And to plug our our little and mighty conference called The Arena, Coming October up in, what, 6th two weeks? and 7th. Two weeks. If you're on the fence, if you're going, why should I go to L.A.? Where <laughs> should I stay? Isn't L.A. crazy? Yes, you should come. You should come be a part of this two-day conference right here in Hollywood, right where we're filming right now. Um, you can stay wherever, but come mm -hmm. to this conference. Tickets are available at earlmcmanus.com slash conference. Mm -hmm. Go to the homepage. You can get it there. Bring a friend. Come in and be here. We have Lewis Howe. We have Jerry Lorenzo. We have... Pia Whitesall, we have Todd Phil Herman, Jones, Phil and Todd Jones. Herman, and um, we have some Jerry Eric. Lorenzo. I know, I've already said that. John Gordon. Yeah, and and if you don't know who some of these people are, check them out on Instagram. I always forget John Gordon, but not as at a disrespect. It's just if we're doing something, John's going to be there. Absolutely, we don't do anything without John. Yeah, he's just the other. He's just the other one of us. You know. Yeah, it's going to be incredible. I'm excited. Okay, yeah. I'll see you guys next week. Actually, next week. We're back on the pod. We're gonna we had some guests lined up, which I'm actually really excited about. I've been saying this forever, but we actually got some. All right, here we go. All right, I'll see you soon. Love you. Love you too.